Greetings, this is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Welcome to part two of the time of Jacob's trouble. This is going to be a study on persecution, tribulation, or trouble, and its purpose in the children of God's lives. Tribulation, uh, it's basically a synonym for trouble. It's just one of those $20 words. So let's take a look at what the Bible has to say, the Holy Scriptures, about trouble and tribulation and persecution. I guess the anchor verse is going to be 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 10 to verse 13. Timothy is called uh, one of the, it's one of the, uh, what they call pastoral epistles or letters, uh, because Timothy was a pastor. And Paul, as an elder, was giving him advice on being a pastor. And even though he was very young, he'd been taught from a very young age by his mother and grandmother about the scriptures. So, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. Paul writes, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now contrast that. It says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But the verse before that says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But if you don't live godly in Christ Jesus, well, you're not going to suffer persecution. So Paul says that he uh, endured persecutions and afflictions. Now, do you think you'd ever hear this message preached at uh, on TBN? No. No, they always teach that uh, send your money in and God will bless you. And a lot of those people, they... They're not sending money in to, to bless the Lord. They're, they're sending money in because they're greedy. They want to be blessed of the Lord. But is the guy with a $30 million Learjet that, that wouldn't even buy a homeless guy a, or, or a disabled person a meal that hadn't eaten in three days? Uh, are, are, is God going to bless that? I don't think so, but that's just my opinion. All right, let's take a look at some more things. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1, now remember Thessalonians was for the, uh, the church at Thessalonica, a city in Greece. Paul was the apostle for the Greeks. And we read, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus Unto the church of the Thessalonians, and God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Think any of the TBN preachers have uh, charity? 
no, I doubt it. Verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. What's well, tribulation? It's trouble. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. What? Our persecutions and tribulations are the manifest token of the righteous judgment of God? That ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Recompense, that means payback, people. It means they're going to be repaid in spades. Verse 7. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore, also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy, count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be magnified, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. How about Romans chapter 8, verse 33, starting? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? You ever heard of uh, when you go into a, when the police arrest you, they charge you with a crime? Well, that's basically what it's saying there. You know, Satan, the accuser. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Now, if you take a look at the book of Job, there are some people that say Job's the oldest book in the Bible, and I wouldn't argue with them. Uh, it's one of the oldest books, if not the oldest book. But let's take a look. So what is the... Why was Job tested? Let's read. Job 1 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God 
and eschewed evil. Eschewed means hates. So he was, and one that feared God and hated evil. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep. That's a lot of sheep, people. And 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. In other words, God had blessed this guy a whole bunch. Verse 4, And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day. And uh, some people say his day, that's like their birthday. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them, and rose up early in the morning, and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. See, Job was a good father. He was offering intercession for his sons. And there are some people that say, oh, well, Job didn't care about his daughters because he didn't do this for his daughters. Well, that's one way of looking at it. Maybe the daughters were godly and he didn't worry about them because they love the Lord with all their hearts. But maybe the sons were a bunch of, a bunch of drunks. I, you know, that's what it sounds like, you know, having a feast on your birthday. I mean, who does that glorify? That glorifies them, not the Lord. So that makes me think that perhaps Job's daughters were far more righteous than his sons. I don't know. That's just my take on it. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not right about a lot of things, I'm sure. But uh, that's just my opinion. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves unto the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Now, who are these sons of God? Well, take a look at Job 38. In Job 38, it said, The sons of God shouted for joy at the foundations, at the foundation of the earth. So the sons of God were shouting for joy when the when the earth was created. Well, Adam was created six days later after the earth was created, because he was created of the dust of the ground of the earth. So it would be impossible for these sons of God here to be any of Adam's children, according to Job 38 in the King James Bible. And when you take a look at Genesis chapter 6, my playlist, the sons of God, you know, Genesis 6, who were the sons of God. Um, that's why a lot of people say, ah, oh, well, Bob, you spend too much time on this, this genealogy stuff. Well, you know, in Genesis 6, these giants from the sons of God laying, you know, with the daughters of men, you know, if the sons of God were believers and the daughters of men were unbelievers, you know, believers and unbelievers don't create giants. I'm sorry. It just doesn't happen. Okay, people say I spend too much time on this stuff, but what can I tell you? I mean, are you willing to spend 15 to 20 to 30, 40, 50 hours of studying to, to, to see this? Or are you just going to quote John 3, 16 and say, God loves everybody for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I mean, to a lot of people, that's that's the only gospel they know i mean it's you know then they can't understand then the atheists come along and say well god is evil because he commanded israel to exterminate the canaanites and you know your christian that's your john 316 christians can't answer them why did god destroy the earth in the flood you know <laughs> The flood of Noah was Noah's family's salvation. 
Remember, we just read that in flaming fire, Jesus is going to come to rain, you know, judgment upon the wicked on the earth. Uh, that's going to be, that's going to be our salvation. People don't get it. You know, God's wrath is, it's our salvation. It's our protection. People don't get it. You know, I don't know. Verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now remember something. God's getting ready to ask a question here. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? You know, he's asking him a question like, you know, God doesn't eat no, right? I mean, give me a break. Whence comest thou? Where, you know, where, where are you coming from, Satan? Then Satan answered the Lord and, and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Yeah, he's, 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 he's walking up and down in it, all right. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God, and escheweth or hates, and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? In other words, does, does Job fear you for nothing? Verse 10, Hast thou made an, uh, hast not thou made an hedge about him? I did an entire Bible study on the hedge. Um, uh, a hedge is like a fence. God fenced off Job. Satan couldn't touch him. He put a fence around him. He says, nope, you can't. No, I put a hedge about him. You can't touch him, Satan. Forget it. So Satan says, Hast thou, hast not thou made a hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Oh yeah, God, you've you've protected him, you've given him everything, you've increased his goods, you've increased his house, you've increased his land, you've given him everything. Verse eleven. But here's the here's the challenge. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy faith. Oh yeah. Take away everything he's got, Lord, and he'll curse you. You watch. That's the Bob version. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy hand. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. In other words, you can touch everything he has, but you can't take his life. Can't kill him, Satan. But you can do anything else you want to him. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. I bet you he was like a uh, bolted out of there like a cheetah, running to make trouble for Job. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away, yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep, and the servants have and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, this is interesting, very interesting to me right here. The, it said the fire of God. Did God bring the fire down to destroy this, or did Satan do it? All right, so uh, who brought the fire down from the sky? Was it God, or was it Satan? Well, let's take a look real quick in Revelation chapter 13. I guess we're going to read the whole chapter. 
And this lines up with the, uh, the end times. And that's what this whole study is all about. I just, it, I'm, I feel like I'm an end times ministry. I, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm a prophet or anything, but it's just, that's, there's so much deception in the world. It's just, and, and they get away with it because uh, the wicked get away with it because, let's face it, the average churchgoer cannot even name 10 books in the Bible. More or less has not never read them. I mean, how many people do you know that have read the Bible cover to cover? I have. I mean, I, I my first year getting saved, I read it cover to cover. It took me five months, but I was doing a whole bunch of individual subject um, Bible studies in between. And I'm not telling you this bragging. I'm just saying I've devoted a lot of time into this. A lot of time and, and just, you know, I, I felt convicted because, you know, just learning and learning and learning it and not sharing. I felt like I felt like I was shortchanging the Lord, felt like a hamster on the wheel, you know, so uh, it's my way of giving back. All right. Revelation 13 verse one. And uh, and I stood upon the sand of the sea. And saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave his power and his seat and great authority. Now who's the dragon? Well, the Bible tells you who the dragon is. All right, so who's the dragon? Revelation 12 and verse 9 tells you the, the chapter before the verse thir chapter 13, verse 9, uh, Revelation 12, 9. And the great dragon was cast out, cast out of where? Heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. So when people tell you that the devil and Satan are two different entities, I don't think so. And we just read in Job where Satan appeared before the Lord. Well, so the dragon that we're reading about in Revelation 13 is the same being. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Bingo. All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, let's see. Go back to Revelation 13 and verse 3. Uh, let's, well, verse 12. And the beast which, verse 2. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So is this going to be a resurrection type deal? You know, he died and comes back to life? You know, as in uh, a mocking of what Christ, his resurrection? I don't know. Verse 4. And they worshipped the dragon. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who was able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's three and a half years, people. This is the last half of what they call the tribulation period, the great tribulation, seven years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain 
from the foundation of the world. If any man have a he an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. So if you're supposed to go into captivity, go. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So in other words, if you're supposed to go into captivity and die for your faith, do it. Now I'm not saying if, if they come to kill your family just because they're evil, protect your family. But if they're coming to kill you for your faith in Christ, and you know it, and you resist them, and, and you use the sword, you know, live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And that's my opinion. Pray on it. Read James chapter 1. Pray on it. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So he's acting like a lamb, but he's really speaking like a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders. And he doeth great wonders, false miracles, people. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So evidently, these, this false Messiah is going to be able to do great wonders and make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And, he, and, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Every time I read this, I always think of television. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bought, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, there's a lot of people will tell you that Sunday, S-U-N, day, is uh, the mark of the beast. I I'm not going to tell them they're wrong, but how do you put Sunday in your forehead or in your right hand? I think it's more more than that. Matter of fact, um, in the Talmud, some of the rabbis write that when they come into their kingdom, that they're going to forbid Gentiles, so-called, to um, keep the Sabbath. They're going to forbid it under penalty of death. They say, well, that's our sign with God, not theirs. So, there might be something to that, you know, Sunday worship, you know, Sabbath worship being forbidden. I, you know, I don't know. There might be something to it. But, but you can't put Sunday in somebody's right hand. And I don't know. They'll say, well, it's what you do and what you think. But in, I don't know, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let he that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and six. Six, six, six. Plain and simple. All right, let's read the companion verse for uh, Revelation 13. That's found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. This is talking about the second coming and us being gathered with him, right? Verse 2, That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. 
Let no man deceive you by any means. You know, when you read Matthew 24, they ask Jesus, uh, what would be the sign of thy coming? And, and he says, be not deceived. You know, these are there's a lot of end time verses uh, in, the in, uh, in the New Testament, but there's a lot in the Old Testament too. People don't realize it. Um, Book of Daniel, a lot of that's end times. I mean, Daniel even said, I don't understand. Explain it to me, basically. And the angel told him, seal it up. Seal up the words. And they wouldn't be, you know, ba I'm paraphrasing, but he, he said basically it wouldn't, you know, it, he wouldn't, they wouldn't understand until the end times. And I'll tell you, the book of Daniel's tough, in my opinion. It's, it's one of the harder books. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? The second coming, the day of Christ. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. Are we, have people fallen away from the faith? Oh yeah. I mean, come to, you know, people. The American Bible Society was created by the United States Congress when George Washington, the first president, was in office. They took public money and printed Bibles and distributed them to libraries and what have you. New Testaments, Old Testaments, the Bible, the Scriptures. Harvard, Yale, Princeton were all started as Bible colleges. Is, do we have a great falling away? Uh, yeah, when you got sodomites getting married and being able to adopt little boys taken away from Christian parents, that's the falling away. When you've got the Church of Satan, yeah, there is one, people. There's a Church of Satan. When you got a Church of Satan that's uh, allowed into prisons, uh, what, what's their gospel? Just, hey, you're a murderer, just be yourself. Satan loves you, right? Well, actually, he hates you. But, uh, you know, the falling away. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who's the man of sin? John, in the book of Revelation, calls him the beast. Um, Other times he's referred to as the Antichrist. Now there are more than, there were many Antichrists. Jerusalem is full of Antichrists. And he's called the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Christ, was called the son of perdition. So this is, there's going to be another son of perdition. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. A lot of people tell you that this happened in 70 A.D. I just, I have a problem with that because they say that was General Titus of the Roman army did this. But the thing was, and I've mentioned this many times in my studies, General Titus was a general of the army. Can you imagine a general of the army telling President Trump, oh, I'm God, bow down and worship me? I don't know if Trump would get mad or if he would laugh. But the emperor of Rome would not have taken lightly General Titus of Rome sitting in the temple of God proclaiming himself that he's God. I don't think so. I think there's going to be another temple. Matter of fact, there's already another temple. It's in Brazil. Look it up. Temple of Solomon, Brazil. They built it. I think they took four years to build it. It's 
quite it's considerably larger than um, you know than the original temple from what I understand and by the way the uh, there's a group called the Temple Mount Faithful bunch of Jews and the Temple Institute another group of Jews and they want to rebuild the temple so who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity, what is iniquity? Evil, wickedness. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. What's a delusion? A delusion is when you're wrong, but you're sure that you're right. Mormons teach that Jesus and Satan are brothers. Do you want Satan's brother for your savior? They're deceived. They're under strong delusion. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, they had pleasure in their unrighteousness. Verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. You want to know why people hate Paul? I just read it. Paul gives a warning about the man of sin, the son of perdition. All right, let's go back to Job 1 and verse 16. Okay. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Remember, Satan said, touch all that Job has and he'll curse thee to thy face. And God said, you can t touch anything you want, but don't take his life, basically. This fire from God? Well, not exactly. It was the, the servant probably thought it was the fire of God, but I think it was the fire from Satan. Satan has powers too, but only only can go as far as the Lord allows him to go. I mean, let's face it, the dragon, the beast, they're going to perform miracles, even bring fire down from the sky to devour their enemies. 17. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I... Only am escaped alone to tell thee. And uh, let's see, 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell 
upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Could you do that, people? Have your sons dead? Lose everything that you have? And yet say, Blessed be the name of the Lord? Wow. Now, let's take a look at Job chapter 42. Verse 1. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do any, do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak. I will demand of thee, and thou and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the, of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor, that means hate, therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for thee, for ye have not spoken of me the, the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad, and the Shushite, and Japhar the Namathite, went and did according as the Lord commanded them, and Job also, and the Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord, listen carefully, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, also, the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Ah, huh. so you thought he had a lot to begin with. Well, the Lord gave him twice as much. Okay. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had had brought unto him, every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning, for he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels, and a 1,000 yoke of oxen, and a 1,000 she-asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. Hmm. You know, I think this is the first place in the Bible where there was a resurrection. The Lord allowed the sons to be killed. I'm not sure that the daughters were dead. But here it is. Now he's got his seven sons. It looks like the seven sons are back and the three daughters. Uh, so, and he called the name of the, of the first Jemima, Jemima, not Aunt Jemima. And the name of the second, Kizia, and the name of the third, Kiran Hapuch. And in all the land were no women found so fair, fair, F-A-I-R, and we're not talking about playing games by the rules. Being fair is a, a how their complexion looked. And when you go to Africa, you're not going to find... Uh, when you go to Central Africa, you're not going to be finding too many people with fair complexions there, if you catch my drift. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job, and their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. 
After this lived Job an hundred and forty years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. And Job died being old and full of days. So, are we to endure suffering? And if you don't know what fair means when you're talking about uh, his daughters were fair, look it up in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Please, don't take my word for it. Okay? Please. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. Now, Jesus was to be our example on, in, in the earth, okay? Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, we know the Satan and the devil, the dragon, all the same being. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written. See, when, the, when Satan comes to tempt us, we should know the scriptures and be able to answer him with scripture. It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Now, people, how can you do that when you've not read the entire Bible? How can you do that? You can't. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. I guess compared to heaven, the glories of this world pale in comparison. Verse 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. How many times have we been ministered by angels and probably didn't even know it? All right, turn to Zechariah chapter 13. Uh, let's see, verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain opened to the house of David. What was Christ? Christ was a direct descendant of King David of Israel. And that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also, I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. Now, these are, uh, my opinion, I say these are the false prophets. Because, it, you know, it says, And I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. And it shall come to pass that when any shall yet prophesy, prophesy then his father and his mother that begat him shall say unto him, Thou shalt not live, for thou speakest lies in the name of the Lord. And his father and his mother that begat him shall thrust him through when he prophesieth. And it shall come to pass in that day that the prophets shall be ashamed every one of his vision when he hath prophesied. Neither shall they wear a rough garment to deceive. See, this is why I think they're false prophets. It says to deceive. 
But he shall say, I am no prophet. I am an husbandman, for man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded, and the house of my friends. Is this a reference to Christ? I think so. Wasn't he wounded in his hands when they nailed him on the cross? What are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, Those which with those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Awake, O sword, against the shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. And I will turn my hand upon the little ones. Isn't that what... Didn't we read that somewhere? Smite the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered? Where did we read that? Just before the... Uh, when Jesus was in the garden, just before the crucifixion and he was going to be taken to be tried, in Matthew 26, 31, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. In Mark 14, 27, And Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Oh, yeah. So, let's go back to Zechariah 13, verse 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd, and the sheep shall be scattered, and I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. But the third shall be left therein. And I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them as silver is refined and will try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Hmm. And I will bring the third part through the fire. What fire? The fires of affliction, people. And will refine them as silver is refined. You know, I was reading about how silver is refined. You know, when you dig metals out of the earth, they're not pure. They're mixed in with other stuff. So what you want to do is you want to make it pure as you can. You know, let's face it. What good is gold if it's only, you know, partly pure? Um, you've heard of 24 karat gold? Well, that's pure gold, pretty much. And it's so soft you can bend it. So that's why you got 18 karat gold, because they mix other stuff in it so that when you make like a wedding ring or something, you know, it's strong because of the other metals. But when you take gold, um, you want to refine it. You get it hot. And then you, you separate the other metals because, you know, gold's going to be heavy, so it'll sink to the bottom. And then the other liquids will float on top. Sort of like when you take water and you take oil and the oil will float on top of the water well you if you skim off all the oil off the top on the bottom all you have left is water well that's what gold is like well silver is the same way uh, gold is pretty much uh, my opinion it's a reference to God and God in us but man is likened unto silver now, when they refine silver, 
if you ask a silversmith, somebody that works with silver, how do they know when the silver is pure and, and when it's when it's perfectly ready? Well, they say, well, you take you take the silver, you heat it up, you scrape the top off of all the impurities, and you know that the silver is done because when it's melted and you look down on it, when you can see your reflection in the silver, you know it's done. It's ready. It's been tried in the fire. It's refined. It's pure. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to put us through the fire, refine us, get rid of all the impurities, so that when he looks at us, he sees himself in us. Think about it. Think about it. Turn to Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. So who was this messenger? John the Baptist, people. All right, who is this messenger? Well, let's go to Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophets. We just read, right? As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy faith, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem, and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Boy, I tell you what, if I confessed all my sins, it would probably take me the rest of my life. And John was clothed with camel's hair and a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. You know, if John the Baptist went to a Baptist church dressed with camel's hair and a girdle of skin about his loins, they would be gossiping about him and say, oh, this guy, pfft shows up in the house of God, and he doesn't even have a suit or a tie. How dare he? They'd probably ask him to leave. We don't want no homeless bums coming here freeloading these wonderful people. Tell me I'm wrong. I've been to those churches. I went to one of their Bible colleges. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And, and you know what? Jesus said, of all those born of women, there was not a greater than John the Baptist. How's that for a testimony? Verse 7. And preach, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. See, they're calling him Jesus of Nazareth, right? But he was born in Bethlehem. Well, Nazareth is not Bethlehem. So, And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the Spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the Spirit driveth him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan, and he and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and saying, 
The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. So let's go back to Malachi. Verse 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. You see, people that don't read the, the Old Testament don't get the connection with the New Testament. And he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. Christ was the messenger of the covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But the old covenant, we couldn't keep it, so he had to make a new one. Even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire. You ever heard of a refinery? They take oil and turn it into oil and gasoline and kerosene. When you refine it, you separate everything. You make things that are pure out of things that are mixed up. For he is like a refiner's fire. Didn't we read that the Lord would come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God? Didn't we read that? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And I will come near to you, to you in judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, and against the adulterers, and against false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear me not, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob, are not consumed. You know, that word Jacob and Israel appears in the Bible hundreds and hundreds of times. I think that's important. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. When ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offering. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, What have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Isn't that what's happening in Washington, D.C. And, and the European Union and Berlin and Brussels and, you know, the wicked are up high. 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake 
often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. What is a book of, a book of remembrance? Is that the Lamb's book of life that we read in Revelation 13? I think so. 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. I'm going to read Revelation chapter 3, and uh, I think I'm going to close this out as part 2. Uh, this is going to probably be a at least a four-part study. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. We're going to read uh, some verses you'll never hear in a church. Almost never. And unto the angel of the church in Sardius write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. So they evidently they're physically alive, but spiritually they're dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. Now there's a heresy going around saying, God doesn't want you to repent of your sins and wickedness, that he only wants you to repent of unbelief. Well, here it is. God's telling the church, the believing church, to repent here. Huh. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die for, for I have found not thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. Repent to what? Unbelief? No. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Did you know that your name could be blotted out of the book of life? What about once saved, always saved, eternal security? Aye. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And believe me, people, you want your name confessed before God, the Father, and his angels. Verse 6, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door. And no man can shut it, for thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Revelation 3, 9. This, this verse you'll never hear in a modern demon nominational church. Absolutely never. You could go for 20 years. Every Bible study. Every Sunday. Every service. And you'll never hear this, word, this verse preached. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. 
Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. He that overcometh, see, we're to be overcomers, people. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, Laodiceans, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I'm going to spit you out. Think about it, people. If you're going to drink iced tea or hot tea, they're both good, right? Or if you're going to drink hot coffee or iced tea, I mean iced coffee, they're both good, right? But if it's lukewarm, eh, you know, the Lord's going to spit them out of his mouth, vomit them out. Verse 17, because thou sayest, I am rich. Oh boy, I tell you what, this is TBN. Think about it, Benny Hinn. TBN, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I got my $30 million Learjet and I got a blessing. I got a $60 million Learjet. Because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Oh boy. He must really love me. I've been spanked many times, and I deserved it. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent of your unbelief. No, repent of your sin. God's not, you know, he's not telling people, he's not telling a believing church to repent of their unbelief. You're talking about a believing church He's telling them to repent of their evil works. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Didn't Jesus overcome? Oh yeah, on the cross. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You see people, we're to be refined in the fire that gets rid of all the dross, the impurities. Do you love the Lord more than you love your home? Do you love the Lord more than your children, your car, your job, your spouse? Do you? All right, we're going to read Matthew 10, 37 and 38, and then we're going to close this out. He that loveth, Jesus speaking, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. So, what can I tell you? All right, well, in the first lesson we found out that 
the Israel was the object of God's love, who he made the covenant with. In the second lesson, we found out what persecution is the purpose of it is for. The next lesson, I think, we're going to find out, well, who is Israel? And there's a lot of different theories on that. But the um, if you listen to the modern de demon nominational church world, they'll tell you, well, that's the people over in the state formerly known as Palestine that they now call Israel. And they'll tell you that those people that call themselves Jews are the chosen people. But like we read in Revelation 3, 9, he said, Jesus said, he knew the blasphemy of those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Well, that's Revelation 2, 9, a verse you'll never hear in the demon nominational churches. So, all right, well, let's, does the Bible identify who Israel is? Oh, yeah. It gives you more than enough hints to be able to figure out who Israel is by telling you who Israel is not. So we'll get to that in lesson three. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And that's Jesus, who is the Christ, in whose precious name I pray. Amen.